Okay, uh, good, well, just good afternoon at, at 12 o'clock. I was just going to give a couple of minutes for a few other uh, registrants uh, just to appear. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay, so we'll do a bit of a check one, two. Um, if you can't hear me, you can use the chat feature uh, to comment to my glamorous assistant, Kira. Um, but hopefully you should be able to hear. We've done a, a dry run. We've got a new headset on today, so... Uh, but also a new laptop, so uh, the headset we're more comfortable with, the laptop <laughs> still still getting used to a little bit. So obviously the new browser, so I don't know if anybody else has Microsoft Edge and a touchscreen laptop, but it's a, it's a whole new world. But then we do work in technology, so we should be able to over, overcome these things. So we'll just give a couple of minutes just for, uh, for a few people to, to, to join. Maybe if someone could give us a positive uh, response on the chat uh, element. Uh, we will be polling uh, during this, so you, ha you have the ability to use the poll section to respond to questions that appear on screen. All good. Excellent. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to make a start. So thanks for taking the time to join us um, for this webinar, uh, Creating Digital Learning for Multiple Audiences. Um, if you are on Twitter and you do like tweeting, uh, the hashtag is hashtag Orion Webinar. Um, we'll try and keep things sort of moving along, try and keep things as practical as possible. There's so much when we, we sat down to look at this topic, but we'll, we'll dive in, we'll show you a few examples. Um, in terms of introductions, um, My name is Gavin Woods. I'm a client services director with, with Orient Learning. Um, so my role is, is to, to go out and, and scope requirements, find out about organizations and their target audience, and help to, to scope the solutions in, in conjunction with, with my colleagues. In terms of what we're going to cover today, we're going to give you a very brief intro to Orient, because I know, I know there's a few familiar faces and names with us today. Um, a brief introduction to Orient Learning. We're going to identify, um, start talking about identifying our audience uh, and looking at their training needs. We we'll use some best practice examples, mostly from government organizations today, uh, just for a change. We do work across all sectors. We have thrown in a couple of other ones, but we're going to mostly look at, at government and public sector organizations. And we're going to look at how learning technologies can support a modern extended enterprise when things start getting a little bit more complicated, moving beyond uh, um, uh, a defined single group. So we'll look at some practical tips and techniques and a couple of reality checks along the way. And then there'll be an option as well as the polls where we'll be, be looking for your input. But if you have any questions at any time, you can enter them and, and Kira will field some of those questions and, and we'll deal with them as, as, as we go along. Brief introduction to Orion then, uh, we very much describe ourselves as a full service online learning partner. Uh, services are really split across three core areas. So development of, of custom e-learning content, whether that be using authoring tools or, or custom HTML5 solutions. Uh, we do a lot of what we call capacity building, sort of training and support for organizations, and I know a couple of people have revealed of that, uh, our capacity building bundle of, of templates and training to help people who are looking to to develop their own content in-house. Uh, and then we deploy a number of platforms, so a number of proprietary learning management systems, uh, the development of learning portals, and, and all those good things in between that help fill the gaps for, for, for the best solution. Um, in terms of who we work with, um, just a snapshot of the more public sector focus to say we do work across all sectors. So if you are in another sector, we'll certainly be happy to give you testimonials and, and reference examples. Uh, but throughout the UK and Ireland, we do a lot of work within the health service, both both in Ireland and, and in Scotland, uh, and a range of other agencies. So very different topics. We always say that the topics that our, uh, that our clients are trying to teach always change, but what, what means the same is our ability to break down um, a particular challenge, advise of options, and, and then to deliver that. Well, that's, enough. that's enough about us. Um, so we'll start off and we'll start thinking about um, a single target audience. So if we, if we imagine that, you know, a typical setting, certainly that we would see when we're speaking to organizations, we have you know, perhaps our L&D team or our HR team, and we have our target audience. So typically it's nicely defined, it's, it's singular, um, it's, uh, you know, th things are, are never easy, but that, that single audience, maybe it's employees, um, they're nicely defined, they're manageable, we create a number of, of e-learning programs maybe across a year, which is no, no easy task, 
and we rule them out, some are better received than, than others. Um, and part of the reason, obviously we can look at the design of our programs, but typically we find a, a big bit actually comes back to looking at the target audience and having an understanding of them. Um, we, um, we are looking at, uh, if we stop and think, and we think about our learners, we actually see that they're, they're far from homogenous. Um, so we have our, our bees here. Kira assures me they're bees. I think bees are the only ones that create honey. Um, is there a, oh, we're all good. Um, sorry, I thought we were having some technical difficulties there. So if we, if we don't consider, even within a single defined our target audience, the, you know, our, our learners aren't homogenous. They certainly wouldn't like to think of themselves as, as worker bees. Um, you know, they, they have different backgrounds, a whole range of different characteristics. And if we don't think about those characteristics to an appropriate degree, it can actually mean that our initiative is doomed to fail. So they're likely to have different jobs, etc. So we're going to think a little bit about what are the characteristics that you might see within your target audience. But we'll start, if you think about the target audience within your organization, now let's think of them at a, at a basic level as a, sing, as a single group. And then we'll, we'll go on to break, break them down or or look at how they might not be a single group. But let's think about them, and we'll ask you a poll question. So Kira's going to launch a poll, and as she does that, I'll just give you the question. So it's how well do you feel that you know your target audience? So you'll be able to select one of the following options, intimately, fairly well, not well enough, or not well at all. So how well do you feel that you know your, your target audience? So if you want to use the, the polling functionality uh, for that, you'll be able to respond and we'll be able to see your your responses coming in. Now we, we always like to do questions where we're, we're going to guess what the right right response is. So before I see the results, I'm going to guess that the majority of people are going to select fairly well. And we're going to share the responses. So you'll, you'll see the responses on, on screen. And and sure enough, we, we, know, them, we know them fairly well. Uh, 19. I'm not going to say they're the honest 19%, but saying they, they don't know them well enough. Uh, but nobody, nobody at, at either extreme. And we find that most people sit around the middle. You know, we, as with all things, you know, we we tend to, to build up build up an image maybe of, of particular groups, and that includes our learners. Uh, and I suppose the more that we engage with them, the more we find out from them. Probably we find out more surprising things. So. It almost sounds like we're starting to plan almost a quality and diversity program. So some of the same techniques that we would do when we're, we're doing that. You know, the more you find out about different groups, you actually learn um, surprising things. Uh, second poll question for you uh, to sort of shape our discussion, uh, and that is, where are the key differences amongst your learners? So choose all that apply. So when you think about the learners and you think, well, maybe maybe they're they're not all the same, and you you know that better than better than we do. But what are the key differences? And we have options. You can select more than one if you like. We have different comfort levels with online learning and technology. Maybe you've got people coming from different experience levels of the subjects at hand. They have different learning styles. Maybe you know that. Maybe you're very tuned in and you know their learning styles and the preferences of how they like to learn. Uh, or maybe there's other barriers in the organization. Maybe some groups within your target audience have different levels of access to technology. So what are the key differences amongst your learners? Choose all that apply. And we have an option for something else. And we'd be very interested if you go for something else that, that you give us a little bit of, of the, the feedback, maybe via the chat, um, so we can, we can see what that something else is. And we can discuss it maybe as we, as we move along. OK, so just give you a, give you a few seconds there. Uh, the majority of people have, have, uh, have voted there. Okay, so we're just going to close that off. Any last minute stragglers? Okay, so we'll close that off and share that, uh, Kira. Okay, so we have okay, 41% different comfort levels with online learning and technology. We would we would see that quite a lot. In fact, that's our well, not our majority, but certainly our biggest biggest response. 27% different experience levels of the subject at hand. 14% different learning styles and preferences. Maybe a follow-up question if you want to comment is, do, do you know the learning styles and preferences of your learners? You know, I, I would say a team that does 
you know, probably has a good level of engagement you know, with their learners, so maybe we only have a snapshot, maybe that's an area where we need to find out more. Um, they have different levels of access to technology, and sometimes the best laid plans can be put, uh, be, uh, be, be cut down maybe by an IT team who, who don't want to make, uh, make changes for, for certain groups. Nobody went for something else, so we must have had a very good, very good and accurate question today, uh, Kira. So we'll, we'll deal with some of those things as we go through, some of those challenges and some of the techniques and tips that you can use, use to counteract them. In terms of our work at, at Orion, we very much uh, focus on uh, really trying to get to know an organization. Um, so sort of peeling back as, a, as the visual will show, really trying to find out more. But what we're really interested in is can we find out enough about the learners? Can we find out about the organization so we can help people to, and I put this in bold, to do their jobs better? Because quite often, if we can focus on that, a very practical sense, yes, it's great for people to, to have knowledge about topics, and that underpinning knowledge is certainly key, but we want them always to be putting it into practice and to be um, you know, really working through things that are going to benefit them in their jobs. And if, if you can do that, that's really the crux of what we try to do um, uh, at Orion. So a little bit of a reality check, because I know, I know you can, we can listen to things that are theoretical, and then we think, well, that, that sounds lovely, but uh, what, what would that really look like uh, in practice? So you know, creating something for everyone. So that's why we look at our single defined group and we start to break them down. We realize we have graduates, we have people who've been with the organization for 20 years, we have people who've just joined because an organization's merged with another uh, agency and suddenly we've got all these new staff that have a different culture. So, you know, we have that understanding, but, you know, creating something for everyone, it was, you know, it was hard enough last year as a team to get uh, to get programs out, you, you may be thinking, so that realistically that's not going to happen. But sometimes it does make sense to do different things for different groups, and we'll lead on, on to some examples. And particularly if budgets are being squeezed, if we can get you know, more tailored, more, more specific learning, but find efficient ways to, to do that, then, then that's going to be benefits to our learner, benefits the output that we have maybe as an L&D team, uh, and ultimately benefits to solving the learning challenges that we face. So we'll, we'll take just some examples. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges, and we'll see some of the techniques, and we will 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 sum sum these up as well. So, you know, we spoke to an organisation, has uh, we have learners who have different levels of experience of the topic at hand. So I think we had 27% of people were in that boat. Um, so some examples and 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 tips for that. So the example that we we'll use in in this case is um, from. Uh, a, a past and an ongoing project with with Tourism Ireland, um, centered around digital marketing. Um, so we'll just launch this, and hopefully you'll be able to see it on screen. So we launched the Tourism Ireland Learning Hub, and I know we have Viv with us. So Viv, you can comment in the chat if I say anything untoward as I go through this. But uh, appreciate you letting us letting us show this. So I think Tourism Ireland, we're doing, we're doing lots of things already, and that's always the case. So we, we built a little HTML5 responsive learning hub. It's not a, a tracked platform, uh, but that's maybe something we're going to look at in, in uh, moving forward. But we'll access uh, the digital marketing programs and the Ireland.com um, module. Now, the reason we wanted to show this was that, you know, Tourism Ireland, you know, very experienced marketeer, certainly the, the likes of Brian, who features in the program, but we also have new starts, and we have people, you know, graduates and people across the across the, the, the world, um, you know, helping to promote Ireland. Um, um, what what the structure follows within the module is actually having the learning model on screen. So there's this idea: people of different experience levels, that you can have a core introduction that everybody has to do. So we have the introduction video of uh, of Brian talking about the topic. Um, now we're blessed with lovely uh, backdrop images of, of Ireland, given the nature of the work that Viv and our colleagues do. We have the, the Learn content, which is our sort of core storyline module. So the idea is, you know, that it gets the, the basics for, for, for people. Um, and we have as well, uh, then maybe you know a little bit more about the topic, so the Learn is maybe a little bit basic for you, but we have the, the Learn More, so you can access additional resources, you can access additional support and further information to take your learning a little bit deeper. So in terms of people with different experiences, that idea of covering the core content, but then allowing the learner a little bit of freedom, what, what do they do next? 
But the big thing uh, as well is, is the ability to have some workplace activities. Now, workplace activities, compared to the effort that, that obviously there's effort involved to create well-structured workplace activities, um, but in terms of the effort compared to uh, interactive content, having workplace activities is quite an effective way to allow people to reflect on their particular job, maybe as group work or as individual tasks. Um, so you have your core content, but then you have that level of personalization coming through in the workplace activities. So we have done projects for, um, you know, for example, for the health service uh, in Scotland, where we've we've created just workplace activities as part of the project. We also have a have a share item within that. So there's a couple couple of techniques on on display there. Oop. Go back to my slideshow. Uh, different organisation wanting to you know acknowledge that the learners came from different roles. So again. You know, we I say we do a lot of work within healthcare, and this is an example taken from our, our work with the health service in, in Scotland. Um, that this is quite a short program. It's developed in Articulate 360, and so that's maybe a webinar for a different day if you're looking at some of the more uh, recent additions to the plethora of authoring tools that there are. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, we, we're using Story 93 and Story, Story 9 360, uh, and some of the different tools in that 360 suite. Um, but in terms of allowing learners to see themselves reflected w within the content, we have, uh, if I launch the program, so it's recognizing that, that learners um, are uh, not homogenous. So a healthcare, wor a healthcare worker you know, ranges from, from a porter through to a surgeon or a senior consultant, and the rules they do are very different. But you might want to equally appeal to, to both groups. So this is a very simple program. It's only 17 slides, but actually three of the slides involve going back to a little group of almost a little bit of very light storytelling, a little group of different newly qualified practitioners representing different roles. So we have Aliyah, our midwife, and we can see you know, a bit of identification with Aliyah. We can see that she's uh, feeling uh, nervous about you know, the, the flying start uh, program for, for new starts. Um, and we can see as well Lucy and Nurse and we actually come back to those groups three times in the 17 slides. So this idea of enabling you to see that you're not in it alone, that somebody else like you is going through the same challenges. So it's a very, very uh, uh, simple example for what the, what the instructional design team have, have done there. So in terms of some of those characteristics and t the challenges and some of the techniques, now this is by no means an exhaustive list, and I'd certainly be interested in any differences uh, of opinion that you have, but we, we just went very quickly, almost a quick fire quiz of what was the first one that came to mind you know, for the challenge. So obviously we'd have a number of techniques for each, and we'll probably beef this up into a downloadable resource that'll be available uh, certainly in, in the next week or two. But a challenge of having lots of different roles a big thing is support the content with workplace activities. So allow, you know, it can be impossible to apply it to all of those rules, but you could create a PDF, say for 10 different business areas uh, with variations of workplace activities or reflective activities. Uh, our learners maybe aren't tech savvy, and we would get that quite a lot, and, and it really comes down to your design approach, you know, sticking to simple navigation, simple interaction types. My mother won't mind me saying that uh, she's a technophobe. I was helping her last night to do a PowerPoint, and I uh, was maybe a little bit surprised uh, that she, she didn't know how to save the PowerPoint. Now, she is, she is a teacher, and she has done this before, but if I was to do something for her, you know, I would, I would need to give clear instructions, actually, how to navigate the program. So you saw that, actually, in the, in the Flying Start example, and typically we would do that at the start, and, and simple interaction types. And maybe even if a very uh, non-tech savvy uh, you know, having a module that almost plays itself with a reliance on, on audio and on on-screen animation. If you've got a broad range of experience levels, when we're thinking a little bit about the TI example there, core overview content and then deeper dive content. If you have limited info about your, our learners, well, one thing we to say would be, you know, find ways you can engage with them, stakeholder groups, surveys, you know, L&D events. But you, you can get them to do a little bit, a little bit of cheat work, do a little bit of work for you. You know, if you inc include pause points in your module, so what would you do in this situation? Maybe some situational judgments, and also reflective activities. How would this apply to your role, etc.? You can get them to do a little bit of the work for you. If people have different access to technology, that can be a real challenge, and sometimes, you, you know, you, you maybe need to get a team of techies to speak to a team of techies, but. Look for technology solutions that are going to help you, maybe with 
uh, single or multiple audiences. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those. Uh, but also look for diplomatic solutions. So for example, we're working with a charity, and they're looking to train their, their volunteers. Um, IT team don't want them to have access to an internal system, so we're looking at a low-cost external system that can host modules for um, for the, those external uh, volunteers. Diplomatic solutions, we're also working with an investment management company in the City of London. and. Uh, you know, they're coming up against a, f a few technical barriers, but they've spoken to their IT team in a sort of human, human-sounding way. Sometimes a bag of, uh, bag of sweets or a basket of muffins can help, help uh, with diplomacy. Uh, but they've actually been able to, to to get what they need in place, to roll out the solution, which, which they probably didn't think that they, they were going to be able to. So it, it shows you sometimes, you know, if you ask in the right way rather than a simple support ticket. It can be easier to get things done if you explain why you, you want you want certain things. If you have resistant learners who are time poor, so we see this a lot, um, whether they're time poor, they claim to be time poor, certainly with senior, senior managers, maybe think about a bite-sized learning campaign rather than something that has to be completed in a single setting. So this idea that maybe senior managers over a period of, of six months could do a social care leadership uh, course, uh, a campaign where they receive short bite-sized nuggets you know, sent out to them in, in, in their email or to their mobile device. Um, resistant learners who dislike training, it's really your instructional design, it's really all about your motivation, your motivation, uh, and your motivation. Um, lone workers um, and difficult topics, so group activities, you know, people can work through some of the gray areas together, um, maybe looking at flipped classroom models where if you're used to working on your own, then you can, you can work on a case study, but then when you, we'll bring you into the classroom and we'll work on it together rather than only bringing you in for the knowledge-based training. So that's us thinking about a single, you know, a single defined group. Uh, I'm just encouraging you to explore that audience to see is it really a single group or are there, are there you know, broad brushstrokes of different groups within it? Um, in terms of a growing audience, so we've looked at exploring a single defined audience. Um, what about things when, you know, when things aren't as simple? So changes and challenges, certainly within you know, government agencies and the public sector, we're saying things are always changing. You know, different things are being rebranded, people are being brought together, agencies are being merged or separated or, or all sorts. Um, so that can change and expand our, our target audience. As well as that, as, uh, that, we may have defined and diverse learner groups. So you might have a remit for training other agencies. You might have a remit for, for training the public. So all those people we sort of think of would make up our extended enterprise. In the corporate sector, you know, that might extend to, say, a car manufacturer and all their dealer network in different countries. So it could be a lot of different factors. And we're having to look for efficiencies of how we do core content and how we give people what they need. So we can form part of our extended enterprise, or, or our multiple audiences. Other government agencies, uh, potentially the public, and that, that's certainly a big area, I think, in healthcare. I think we're going to see more and more of that. So we're, we're doing a big project, big behavior change project at, at the moment. Um, but we're going to see, you know, if, if we can educate a member of the public to make better choice, lifestyle choices, maybe about diet or exercise or alcohol or tobacco, that's actually going to solve the challenges of the healthcare organization that's, that's overstretched. So there can be different groups outside of our, our direct remit. It could be distributors or partners if you're in the corporate sector. It could be suppliers. So, if, for example, if you're in the prison sector, we've done some in that area of e-procurement. Um, then you know suppliers and educating them about what's expected of them from a compliance point of view, but also a practical point of view, um, that can actually solve some of your problems. And it can be other stakeholder groups. So we did a project recently uh, for a large charity with schools, uh, and had schools. We had parents and involved in the project. We had school management. We had the teachers, and last but not least, we had the pupils themselves. So we had four or five very defined groups. So it might not always fall directly under your remit. So sometimes you may be, you know, you may be, you know, looking to bring, uh, you know, an additional focus. But if you're, you know, if you're focused on the challenges, it might be something you want to branch out to, because there can be clear benefits in providing online training for for some of those groups in your in your extended enterprise. So a bit of reality check, you might say, look, I've got enough on my plate. You know, we've got 
couple of hundred, maybe a thousand staff. Uh, you know, we're training them. They 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 keep me busy. I, I don't need to look for other groups. So you know, why might we be reluctant? Well, there there might be costs involved, depending on how we approach it. It may or may not be our job to train them. We might be wary. I think there's you know, it could be wariness if we make something available to the public. Uh, you know. Is there a risk involved in that? Well, yes, I think there is, but it can be mitigated. Um, or will people maybe get expectations that we're going to offer you know, more training in the future? We might have limited knowledge of the different groups because they're not necessarily directly within that you know, inner circle uh, in terms of our visibility of them, and there might be some technical restrict restrictions to doing that. So we do understand that different audiences impact on the challenges, and I don't think the uh, the challenges involved are, are insurmountable. They just need some some careful thought. So we'll pick uh, a, a couple of examples, and maybe a monthly audience uh, example. Uh, we're just embarking on a project with the National Treasury Management Agency, specifically the State Claims Agency in the in the south of Ireland. Uh, so the challenge is that they have a responsibility, as a lot of agencies do, that they're experts in their particular area, and they have to train partner agencies in incident management. So there's a number of core messages, and each agency, but each agency operates within a unique setting. So they are dealing with incident management, but an incident in the police service is quite different to an incident, say, within the HSE, the healthcare, or within the defence services. Uh, all the agencies require systems training. But they all have slightly different uh, screens because they enter different things within a, an incident management system. And there's also, you know, core messages we want to get across in identifying and dealing and logging and updating uh, incidents. So the solution that that we're opting for, and we'll likely do a follow-up webinar where we'll, we'll let you see this. Um, a system we find that's really good if you've got multiple audiences is a system called LearnUpon. It's a cloud-based LMS uh, that, that we offer. Uh, and it allows for multiple front ends within a single subscription. So there's the ability to have a generic NTMA portal, but actually have a tailored, co-branded portal for core agencies, and have uh, you know smaller agencies using a using a generic one. We're creating uh, common shared content uh, in Storyline Three. Uh, we're also creating some captivate uh, screen capture videos. Now the screens do change, but we're able, from an instructional design perspective, to create a common structure. For that systems training, um, so it follows the same thing, and the only thing that changes is the screen. So that takes a little bit of, of thought, but it's certainly very efficient from a cost and time perspective. And then probably the big thing to drive home the learning is we have the core content, and then we have uh, we'll have individual scenario packs for individual agencies, so offering that tailored application. So the approach that we're taking there with multiple front ends means that an agency can log in. See the core content, see the scenario pack um, that's that's just for them, rather than us having to put a whole list of courses in a single front end portal uh, that might get a little bit busy with the number of agencies that are involved. So it is scalable as well because for the larger agency partners, there's other training going on, and those those portals can be built up with additional training materials. Skip from the public sector to the corporate sector. Um, and this idea of you know maybe thinking outside your immediate remit, and a really great example of that, we we'll put the link on screen so you actually see what RP Adam have done about that. Is the the Arpel Group or RP Adam as commercial uh, uh, cleaning um, manufacturing uh, company, uh, long-standing successful family business in Scotland, uh, working within with UK, UK Ireland and also in the Gulf, they have cr actually taken the decision, and it's always been the case. That they have actually offered training to the staff of their clients. Now, obviously, there's an element about using their products correctly, but it goes it goes broader than that into the safe use of chemicals. Um, now, there's not a direct remit there to to train the staff of uh, of clients, um, but it it actually offers significant added value and a differentiator within the market, and really deepens the the relationship that RP Adam has with clients. So, through offering an online uh, version. Um, they've been able to reduce 8,000 8, man hours uh, that, that were spent training, but actually they've been able to do training and working with client, engaging with clients in other ways because of that. So actually, actually doing more training. So it's been able to, to really, um, you know, uh, again enhance that differentiator as a core uh, selling point of the company. If we think about um, making content available to the public, an example would be the, the 
I believe we might have some of our colleagues from the FSCI with us today. Um, so the menu call initiative is rolled out in Ireland. It's actually targeted primarily at food businesses. Uh, it looks at, looks at both calories, but um, then new allergy legislation. So when we're, we're doing something that was going to be, albeit food businesses, it's a public audience. You know, probably you want to have a reliance on on less text. You want engaging uh, visuals. They're going to draw people in. So we have Ollie the chef. We have. Um, our starter main course dessert. We have bright, colourful sort of custom illustrations and interactions. And in terms of reuse of content for different groups, some some things that were used for internal training uh, will also be able to use for for the public and for food businesses and even for the launch event. So we created a little animated explainer. That's all. They just saying saying hello to you. And uh, Ollie was able to be used actually at the launch event. So we've done that a couple of times. We've had you know general overview videos that being able to act as support tools, being able to actually act as part of the comms uh, as well that you have uh, when you're rolling out your program. An example of uh, Queen's University Belfast. Um, when we talk about, I suppose, having a program, one that it, you know prompts the learner to reflect. We, we've done a lot of equality, diversity, good relations programs for, for different organizations, so it is a particular expertise. And it's, it's the ability to have something that really reflected Queen's. So I'm going to turn off the sound, because I have the sound going in my in my ears as well as I'm trying to speak to you. But this is a responsive HTML5 program, and I very much wanted it to be Queen's. We have imagery and students actually from, from Queen's in the program. Um, it's built around really around three core scenarios. So organize an event, an evening with new friends, and and group work. So I'll just show you show you one of those. So one of the things we talk about when you have multiple audiences, making sure that they're all represented, and, and nowhere is probably more important to do that when you think of the diversity involved in a student population. Um, one of the biggest things that we learned straight off the bat with Queens was that the amount of international students, students from different backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, sexualities, um, you know, ages as well, mature students. So we're really trying to get something that reflected a whole range of different people. And obviously, we, you know, within Northern Ireland, we have our, uh, other differences as well that are well documented. So making sure we had something that reflected the whole the whole student body. So we have. Uh, Different scenarios is more of a photo story scenario that, that takes you through. We have a video scenario. Uh, we have pause points and reflections. So this deals with uh, trans awareness. Um, and we have different pause points and questions along the way that the learner is prompted to, to reflect on. So we managed to use student actors and uh, you know for a photo shoot, so it worked out really well. So we have a little social media uh, based scenario as well. So it's trying to be current to students. So something's going to be rolled out um, increasingly as a mandatory uh, program for undergraduates as part of uh, the general diversity work. So Queens are a really great organisation. If you're interested in diversity, we can put you in touch with some people that are doing all sorts of things, winning all sorts of uh, uh, awards recently. We have a little social media. Scenario where you're you're going through with Kayla. She's planning her event. Who is she going to invite to that? But as well, right throughout, as well as those little questions, you actually have bigger activities that can be used as uh, reflective. So you know, we encourage people to have paper and pens, and you know, require you to have text entry. So you know, again, you know, not assuming we know everything about the learner, asking them to think, you know, independently or maybe as part of a group about how that affects them. How would they act in similar situations? What are you know? What would they do to make people feel more more welcome and, and inclusive? So some tips and techniques for for multiple audiences. We're, we're rattling rattling through this. Um, some t tips and techniques. So multi audience technique. Uh, one is in, ensure that your audience is is represented. So whenever we're we're looking, you know, we obviously have quite a a defined methodology we go through in the, our content planning, storyboarding, instructional design stages. So we identify the competencies that we want to teach. Quite often we'll create a competency matrix um, and we'll actually create um, a tally to check off one that we're covering all the key competencies in in uh, through our scenario. So a scenario might actually cover four or five different competencies if it's well scripted and crafted. Um, but we're also making sure that we're covering key job roles and then something say like the Queen's program 
we're, we're, we're ticking off that we're covering the, the different um, identified groups or, or maybe particular problem groups. So that a learner um, you know, in a particular role is, is actually represented within the program, within the treatment. Um, so if we do scenarios that don't have a particular role, we might have a case study that focuses on that, that role so that people straight from the off can can get the feeling. Actually, this is for, for me. This isn't created for you know only our uh, HR team. Uh, this is actually created for for everybody. You can reuse uh, content uh, where you can. Um, so start with the core messages, but think about how you package your content. So having things as re reusable learning objects, you might have heard of RLOs, reusable learning objects, but it really just means packaging content, you know, in particular assets or interactions that can be reused. So for example, we did something for a utilities company in Scotland. Um, we were able to create something about uh, quality standards in general, uh, and then something specifically about asset management standard. But the quality standards one was also be able to be used as the introduction to three or four other uh, different ISO standard based modules. So that idea, if you if you think about that when you're planning it, just keep an ear open. Where could this be reused? Can it be repurposed? Quite often we like to ask people, you know, what do you have within an organisation? What does your what does your marketing team have? You know, if they have a general overview, uh, you know, showing you around, say, the campus, for example, of a hospital. Well, we could use that video and put a different voiceover over it to talk about the workplace and the different places of work within the hospital. Um, make your content more relevant. So a big thing is around stakeholder engagement, and I know probably public sector organizations, uh, and many of them your organizations, are actually better at doing this than, than maybe the corporate uh, sector. So I know some have defined stakeholder workshops uh, within, you know, to get input uh, from your audience. I think rather than you know, those typically we would facilitate those, but you know, keep them sort of on track. You know, people have opinions, and it's great to you know take people's opinions. But probably a tip is to give um, give your stakeholders clearly defined tasks when you're you're engaging with them, so that you know they're either answering a set of questions or maybe you you're giving them, for example, a very brief scenario overview template and asking them to work with a couple of their colleagues within a particular area of the organisation to give you you know, a rough outline of an appropriate scenario. That's, do, doing that and having that planning can be quite simple if you can get people to engage with you um, and you have the ability to to get something that's going to be a bit more on the money for those particular groups. So how better to, than to come back with something that's a real, maybe not the, the most common scenario within the organization, but, you know, across your different programs having scenarios that actually ref, reflect everybody. Um, obviously, we've still got to pay attention to those core messages. Uh, seek efficiency of instructional design efforts. So we use a lot of templates. Now, templates do, don't don't mean that the end result actually ends up just being the same as you know the one you did last week. But it's it's a good way to sort of shape the thinking, particularly from an instructional design perspective, to make sure that you you tick off. So I suppose when an organisation engages with us, that's probably you know a big bit of of the value you know that's being brought is is that approach and the ability to ask questions um, that, that that maybe aren't always asked within the organisation. So build build in subtle changes for different groups. So that idea of, of personalization techniques within your content. So it's possible certainly within authoring tools without over complicating things to have a single course with some different tracks. But it can be, you know, if you just focus on maybe on key, changing key slides and having lots of reflection as a, as a sort of workaround, then it can actually end up with one learning resource sitting on your learning management system, but within it are a number of different tracks that really appeal to, to different groups. Okay, we'll take some questions. We have a couple of other things that we can show you. We're probably slightly, slightly ahead of time. Okay, so I'll take some, some questions. I know there's been a few coming in, Kira. Um, so, Nicola asks, as a, as a charity with a limited budget and a remote workforce that have varying technology capabilities and who we have constant difficulty trying to complete their e-learning, what would you recommend we focus on to engage your learners, our learners more effectively? Oh, Nicola, that's a meaty one. I'm not sure I was ready for that straight off the bat. Uh, it might be something we'll have to discuss a little bit further with you, but I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you my best answer that, that we can. Um, okay, so we've got varying technology technology abil abilities, difficulty in trying to complete uh, e-learning. Um, I think one one of the things we do, Nicola, we we have a model called Impact, 
and we really look the the I I never get as far as remembering all of our acronyms, but the I and the M stand for interest and motivation. So we try and include something right at the start of of a program that really grabs attention. And that's why sometimes you know, maybe it might be animated content or a piece of video. So for example, when we did a compliance um you know, I'm sure you do something in the area of data protection, and it's a it's a big area at the moment with GDPR coming up uh, next year. Okay, I leaned on the mute button there. That's not on my little headset. So, do you know roughly how, how long you're off there? Because I give you a really good answer, Nicola. Just in case you didn't, you didn't hear it. Um, I was just saying about making content really engaging, really focus on what is going to help people do their jobs better. And uh, you know, say we've done a compliance content on data protection where we've not talked about the policy at all. People don't really like hearing about policies. It's, it's important for people sometimes to read them and mark that they've read them from a compliance point of view but it doesn't really necessarily uh, change their, their, their behavior. Um, what, what would change their behavior is them realizing that actually this isn't a policy, this is something either that affects real people, our stakeholders, or affects me. And a little bit of carrot and sticks at times, you know, you know, people, we do deal with topics where people can lose their jobs over certain things, you know, and, and one of the things maybe worth looking at, Nicola, we could share with you something we did for, for CRUK. Um, which was on health and safety essentials. I can share that example with you. It has sort of a light touch, but it was used to relaunch their, their e-learning. So we could share, share that with you, you have a look at that. But we could, we could talk more about, about that uh, offline. We'll, we'll think a little bit more maybe about that answer and give you a little bit more. Um, Tom, uh, you've said, do you offer training on Storyline or other offering tools? We, we do, we, we offer uh, training on Storyline. We're just updating our courses for Storyline 3 and 360. Uh, we do offer Captivate training, um, particularly for product sims and Camtasia, uh, and we have on occasions done other tools, but probably uh, centered around the, the articulate uh, suite. So we have our capacity building bundle. You can see that on our website. We can send you some some info about that. Uh, Sabine, uh, just trying to see your first. I think I missed the first part of your question, Sabine. Maybe you could type that in again as as with regards to paper based learning. But I think we just missed the first part of it. Um, have we found, this is a question from Linda, have we found a challenge in the public sector health where senior managers want to use digital solutions more as tick box telling than learning? Trying not to sound cynical. Yes. <laughs> yes is a short answer. So I suppose compliance and the ability you know, for a senior manager, I suppose they're one of your stakeholders. Um, and it can, obviously they, they can have a lot of sway. Uh, Linda, you know, when you're dealing with senior manager, but other other stakeholders are are your learners. Um, so you've got to give the managers what they need. So we do build things in. You know, they're going to tick boxes. Have you read this policy, etc.? You know, yes, yeah, yes, we have. But the, I think the big onus, and increasingly, I think this is going to be the case, is on the learning development professional to benchmark what they were doing and to be able to show real and tangible uh, business improvements. So I think the area of learning analytics and ROI has only been sort of lightly touched on. I think in the next few years that's really gonna gonna explode. I think you're gonna see technologies and things, particularly around Tin Can and, and X API that are that are gonna gonna help with that. Uh, any good techniques for transforming transforming e learning into paper based learning to increase accessibility? Can we plan for this while we create e learning? Well, we can, Sabine, because you know, we, we talk about simple, simple, uh, different groups, multiple audiences. We developed something for Belfast City Council. And due to the nature of their jobs, some staff were not comfortable with technology and they were not going to be given time within the day or the expectation for them to do it at home to access e learning. So, we on a number, a number of occasions now have done a paper based workbook. We, where we've designed our e-learning interactions in the, in the planning phase. We designed that in line with 
uh, knowing that it's going to end up as a workbook as well. So we've not done interactions that over relied on animation or JavaScript or you know, complex layers. Uh, and we've been able to print off a workbook with some of the same slides, some of the same nice visuals, but then we've we've either had versions that can be completed in a workbook or can be discussed in a classroom uh, training session. So it is possible, it's just something that needs to be considered from the off. Uh, Bjorn, you've asked, a huge amount of research is done on the effects of climate change on protected areas. The new knowledge is not e easily available uh, for for the PA managers. Maybe just explain, Bjorn, what PA means. Um, is e-learning suitable? You're probably asking the wrong person, Bjorn, and I'll be honest with you, we've not come across a topic that we don't think e-learning of, of some form. I think one of the things, you know, wouldn't be suitable. Um, I think one of the things is that uh, there's maybe a misconception that we're, we're solely about e-learning. We're predominantly oh, protected areas, sorry, protected areas managers. Uh, okay, so a huge amount of research done. I'll just read it again. A huge amount of research done on the effects of climate change on protected areas. So new knowledge is not easily available for PA managers. So you're trying to roll out knowledge. You're trying to maybe show the effects Bjorn of of climate change on protected areas. I know it's a very hot topic at the moment, given what some people have decided to do about it or not do. Um, Yes, you know, you know, it appears that e-learning would be suitable. It'd be it'd be find out a little bit more about how those managers currently learn. Um, you know, t types of things you probably look to maybe create some case study examples around. You know, maybe some of the most severe effects of climate change. I know there's a lot of talk at the moment about uh, a glacier ice shelf that's only about 65 kilometers, about breaking off one of the biggest calving exercises. That's my my iceberg knowledge. Um, so yeah, it, you know, find out a little bit more about that. It's something you know we could explore with you off offline. Have we worked with small charities before? Uh, Jean, Jean asks. We we have Jean. Um, you know, and we're we're used. We always say, you know, we, we always can at least offer the best solution. That, you know, respecting people have limited. And I've, I've leaned on the, the mute button again. Uh, apologies for that. I need to stop my, my roaming elbows. Um, so Jean, Jean was asking, have we worked with, with small charities before? You know, essentially people with, with uh, limited budgets. We have. There, there are different platforms that work really well, really cost effective. Uh, Learn, Learn upon is an, a learning management system well worth looking at. We also have a new initiative called Course Kit, where we're creating uh, multiple... Uh, cor courses and they're going to sit between be better than a ready-made off-the-shelf course but that you'll be able to tailor them so you get some of that custom custom learning experience but a, it's going to be a low one-off cost without subscriptions in key areas so that might be a good area to, to start to look at um, okay okay uh, Have we got any any other questions there? I know we're, we're covering a lot. So so one of the things we'll we'll do any any questions um, we'll we'll contact you, you know, and you can you can send us uh, in uh, an email. We'll also send the slides to everybody. Um, we're we're more than happy to have have a conversation. You know, it's really you know, we talk about we do you know we do your e learning. Really, what we do is we help people to solve problems. And we quite enjoy it as well. So, uh, poses a good problem. I know uh, the first question we had there was a was a good one. There was uh, multiple factors in that, and I think we, we can maybe explore that uh, a little bit more. Um, has anybody got any other any other queries? We might even finish a little bit early today. Um, so we do we do do a series of webinars. Um, we also run different different masterclass events. Um, I think we have a couple. Okay, great. Thanks, Alan. Uh, a few comments there. Okay, so one one of the things we're going to do is we're going to beef up those two matrices that are shown. You know, it's not going to be an exhaustive list of answers. You know, the best answers to a problem are dependent on the problem itself. But at least be some guide around some some typical challenges. So we're going to beef that up and we'll make that available to, to you alongside the slides. Um, without that, I'll let you get back to your 
get back to your lunch or get back to your, your work, whatever's the case. But thanks for joining us today. Hopefully it was short, sharp, informative. Uh, any follow-up that you like, you know, we're more than happy to get you the answers if you felt that some things were left unanswered for you today. Okay, thanks a lot.